Hello, I'm Dr. Paul Belzicki, and um, I graduated in 1979, and I've been in private practice in Toronto since that time. This presentation was initiated when Shiraz contacted me after I posted some remarks regarding the quality of materials on the site. And she suggested I put something together, and this is the result. And I hope you find it informative. For the record, I'm not funded by anyone, so what follows are my own personal opinions and observations that are supported with photographic evidence of case treatments spanning, in some cases, three decades. I'm a general practitioner that provides endodontics, periodontics, and prosthodontics. I have found it intellectually engaging and clinically advantageous to personally carry out these treatment phases as one person. This uh, presentation could have many titles, but given a lot of the questions that are asked on the OASIS site, a lot of them refer to what will last, what will be successful, what materials should I use? And it's with that in mind that I titled this the delivery of long lasting restorations, because I have many restorations that I've placed in people, obviously, that are in some cases, 30 years old. For long-term survival, one must expertly manage all treatment phases to minimize errors in diagnosis, treatment planning, clinical techniques, and laboratory protocol. Now, this isn't new to anybody. It's, uh, it should be cognizant each and every time we provide treatment for somebody. We try to do the best that we can do. If success has been referred to as a chain where the ultimate strength rests on the weakest link, one must recognize and manage these critical links because they're the ones that will cause the failure. It is hoped that this presentation provides insight for maintaining teeth that at first appear to have a less than ideal long-term prognosis. Rather than jumping to implants right away, uh, can we get more life out of a tooth? I'm of the opinion that the ultimate treatment goal is to design and deliver therapy that's long lasting. And I think each and every one of us would want that if we're the recipients of care. Hence, one must employ evidence-based techniques and materials that have historically withstood the test of time. And for 35 years, I've relied on amalgam, gold, and porcelain fused to metal restorations. Yes, I do use composite resin restorations in the anterior. And for 10 years, I've used all ceramic crowns in the anterior as well. But I must say that they don't give me that warm, fuzzy feeling that porcelain fused to metal does. And it is with this case that I hope to drive this home. In 1983, I was 30, and this patient was 50, and he had lived for some time with this lateral that was out towards the buckle, and he wanted an aesthetic improvement. In 1983, implants were new on the horizon, and I don't even think protocol was in place at that time for single tooth replacement with an implant in the anterior. So the treatment plan was to extract this tooth and place a three unit bridge on the teeth on either side. And the patient would wear that provisional during the healing phase. And you can see that this gentleman is a product of that generation that did not have the benefits of fluoridated water. And many of these restorations, these are acrylic on gold and amalgam were placed by my predecessor and they've been in place for decades as well. Here are those prepared teeth on the day of insertion. I apologize for the quality of this photograph. It is a digital representation of a nectochrome slide I took back in 1983. But what I can point out is the judicious tooth preparation and control of soft tissue. The patient has been wearing this provisional for, I assume, three to four months or five months to allow for healing of the socket. And we can see that there's absolutely no bleeding and no irritation of the soft tissue. So proper fitting, accurate fitting provisionals are utmost important in control of soft tissue. And as you, we can see here, the margin is just tucked into the sulcus, and it follows the outline, the contour of the gingival margin. 
here is that three unit bridge. Back in 1983, aesthetic demands were different. Lab techniques were not yet in place for predictable porcelain butt joints. And so these are fine metal margins and it was thought with good reason that these provided a, a exceptional seal and adaptation. These things can be finely polished and, and adapted to the margin. And here the case has been cemented in. And that metal margin is tucked just under the gingiva into the sulcus. And in my opinion, the ceramist at that time did a wonderful job matching the color anomaly on the other central incisor. And this was about the first aesthetic three unit bridge I'd put in in practice. And uh, it held up very, very nicely. In 2007, the patient retired and moved overseas. But over the course of time, I had redone most of the bridge work, extracted some teeth and placed a, a bridge in the anterior. And all of this work has been in place. The only two teeth I didn't touch were the central lateral on the other side because of the color match that was attained by the ceramist. And I've grown attached to patients and I've grown attached to the work I've done. And they've, grow, they've grown attached to me as well. And in 2013, he called me from overseas and he said he had some discomfort in the upper anterior and nobody's been able to find the reason why. So he flew back to Toronto and this is how he presented in 2013, some 30 years after the placement of this bridge. And yes, the metal margins are exposed, but this is not pathological. This is just normal physiological recession that occurs with aging. It was determined that there was bone loss that had occurred over the buckle of uh, this central. And the treatment plan was to remove this tooth and then remove the bridge and then place a new bridge from the lateral to the central to the cuspid. Now I've grown attached to this bridge. It was one of the first ones I had made in, in practice. And it, it was with some sadness that I cut through porcelain down to metal and then down to tooth structure. And here are those abutment teeth the moment the bridge was removed. And as you can see, that bridge has maintained the health and integrity of these abutment teeth. For comparison, here is that, those teeth in 1983. And as you can see, not much has changed. Uh, the little bit of dical, I would imagine, that's present here is still present. So porcelain bonded to metal, porcelain fused to metal bridge work, if done properly, will stand the test of time. Here is the interior of those retainers. And as you can see, the cement is patent, still in place. The little bit that's missing here is still stuck on the tooth structure. And this is poly F cement. It's a polycarboxylate cement. And if you look at some of the ads uh, for new current cements where they list all the cements that have historically been used, polycarboxylate seems to be at the low end of the list of retentiveness and durability. But I beg to differ because over 30 years, this material has secured these teeth and maintained the health of tissue. If you don't photograph your cases, I suggest you do so because often they'll provide evidence for yourself and uh, for your colleagues. They'll provide evidence for justification for choices made on methods and materials. And if you're not blown away by this, just consider over those 30 years, I've gone from here to here. And to realize that this patient over 30 years has used this bridge every second of every day to smile, engage the world, to speak, to eat, to whisper, to, to do everything. Yes, we do impact our patients. We do impact their quality of life significantly. So for long lasting restorations, as I said, we need to employ techniques and materials that have historically withstood the test of time. For small and large restorations, Course infused to metal in combination with this traditional looting cement 
has predictably done so. But it's not an accident. There, we have to follow a protocol that's planned so that success occurs each and every time. From simple to complex cases, we must ensure stable periodontal health before insertion of a final case. It's ill-conceived that bleeding unhealthy tissue will somehow miraculously heal upon the placement of a final prosthesis. If the skin is not healthy in the provisional phase, something is not right. Mother Nature is trying to tell you that. All restorative margins must be finished on sound tooth structure and sufficiently coronal to a healthy zone of, a, of gingival attachment. And secondly, we need accurately fitting provisionals that are contoured properly to be harmonious with, with the periodontium. And this is important because of rule one. You will not fool mother nature. If it's off by a little bit, it might as well be off by a mile. And we'll quickly just review the concept of biologic width. I do this because when providing periodontal therapy in conjunction with your, prosthes with your prosthetics, if you're the one treating the gums, if you're the one cutting the, the tissue back, you become very, very cognizant of the restorative endeavor and trying to protect the surgical phase that was accomplished. So let's zoom in on this area. It's critical to understand biologic width and the zone of attachment. Here is our tooth. This is enamel. This is the CEJ. We have soft tissue, epithelium. There's a gingival sulcus, which is a potential space. We have the attachment of the epithelium to the enamel. And then we have the attachment of the connective tissue by way of collagen fibers that are inserted into, into root structure and, of course, the bone. Here is the same in histological section. Again, soft tissue, bone, tooth, our enamel, the sulcus, the epithelial attachment, the connective tissue. The epithelial attachment and the connective tissue combine to form this zone of attachment or biologic width, which from top to bottom is about two, two and a half millimeters. We must not violate the zone of attachment because it forms a protective barrier against the ingress of pathogens. Let's zoom in even further. Here is that area enlarged again. Ideally, if we have to engage this area, we would like to just drop the margin into the gingival sulcus. And our margins have to be flush and well contoured so that it's almost imperceptible running from tooth structure to restorative material. But we live in the real world and often when chasing decay or for aesthetic concerns, sometimes we find ourselves a little deeper into the epithelial attachment. And now it becomes critical that our margins are well adapted and well fitting. We would like to avoid over contoured margins because they provide a mechanical irritation which will affect the health of the epithelium. And of course, we would like to avoid any open margins. So our impression protocol and lab protocol are very critical to providing success. We don't want fluids ingressing here and washing out cements. And the last thing we would want to do is slam restorative materials into the connective tissue attachment close to the crest of bone because this will result in negative consequences. And it's with this case I'd like to point those out. Obviously, this crown is not properly contoured, and those metal margins are in an area where they should not be. This is the clinical photograph, and we've got fibrous over overgrowth. Now, when tissue is irritated in such a manner, the body responds with two extremes. Either we get fibrous overgrowth or we get recession, and it depends on the biotype. Often you'll get both, depending on, on the patient's response. This isn't really a concern for the patient. Yes, it's tender sometimes, he complains. It bleeds when he brushes it at times, but it really doesn't bother him other than when he flosses or attempts to clean in between. He gets a really bad smell and that bothers them. So the treatment plan 
was to remove this cram, possibly provide periodontal surgery to facilitate cram lengthening, establish new margins, place a provisional cram, close the flaps, let the patient go for a few months, have them come back, and take a new impression for a proper fitting cram. Upon removal of the crown, my optimism took a bit of a hit. Here we're, we're met with ulcerated hemorrhagic tissue and a crown preparation that uh, looks less than optimal. When the composite core was touched with the probe, it dislodged immediately. And this was probably, probably a result of contamination of the tooth substrate when bonding was attempted it probably got contaminated with blood so it popped out immediately and this image now makes me rethink do i really want to attempt um, crown lengthening do i really want to try to retain this tooth an elevation of a flap we're met with a circular lesion in this area. And I was unsure if this was root recession, sorry, a, a root resorption of some kind, or some iatrogenic event at the time of at the time of crown fabrication. But the thought of sacrificing this much robust bone to try to establish a new margin, I thought was ill-advised. So the tooth was was extracted. I did, prior to extraction, I did put this crown back in, and this slice is just the, uh, where the metal had been removed from the burr. So you can see that here is the margin, and here is that lesion or resorptive entity, apical to our crown margin. And this is what the body has been trying to contend with all these years. When I did pop the crown off, I did take a radiograph prior to removing the core, and even in this phase, I could not see that lesion. It did remain hidden. But again, trying to remove this much bone or some bone to get a margin with the presence of the sinus in this area, I just thought it was ill-advised. So the tooth was extracted. And here you can see what the body has been trying to contend with all these years. So there is a biological price to be paid for ill-fitting restorations. You will not fool Mother Nature. I'd like to present this less than ideal situation for long-term success. This patient presented uh, to my office with a chief complaint of the packing of food in between these two molars. And we can see that there are two composite resins that were placed with a lack of an adequate contact and she's packing food into this area. The radiograph reveals that the second molar was endodontically treated. Uh, the first molar may need endodontics due to the proximity of this restoration to the pulp chamber and the canal in the distal buccal root. Both restorations are very deep into the gingival sulcus, probably disrupting the biologic width. On closer examination and what was pointed out to the patient with this radiograph is the problem of a root proximity problem between the distal buccal root of the 16 and the mesial buccal root of the 17. Trying to place a crown on this tooth, trying to attain a crown margin Given the fluting of the roots and the hourglass shape that is at the level of the trunk area here would be very, very technically difficult. And maintaining that over the course of a lifetime is near impossible. And that's the weak link, is this area here. How do I manage that so that delivering crowns and assuring the patient that her money is well spent, this, this will prove a challenge, and that's, that's the weak link. So in this case, uh, the treatment plan was to provide endodontic therapy for the 16, place two provisional crowns on the 16 and the 17, and then provide 
root resection or root amputation of the distal buccal root to eliminate the root proximity problem. Here, both teeth were prepared to accept provisional crowns, and the endodontics was carried out as well. Here are the provisional crowns, and the crown margins fit very, very accurately on this tooth. My material of choice is powder liquid methyl methacrylate, old-fashioned denture acrylic, but obviously tooth colored. And for the following reasons, it will set in a moist field, and often provisional, provisional crowns, temporary crowns, are done at the time of, of surgery. This material can be added to an infinite number of times over an infinite period of time because the union of new material to set material is at, is at the molecular level. So you can repair and add and subtract at will. The material is durable, particularly in long span bridges, and it is most cost effective. Crowns are cemented in and cleaned up and the patient is dismissed in order to assess the success of our endodontic therapy. And patient returns, the teeth are asymptomatic and this is the day that we're going to provide the root resection. A small flap is raised, it needn't be any bigger, there were no other periodontal concerns on any of the adjacent teeth. And here you can see that the more apical you go, the more this root flares out towards the second molar. And it's difficult to get a photograph of it because uh, it keeps welling up with blood, but you can probe deeply and feel the two roots touching. Now, I said earlier that my treatment philosophy is to try to integrate perio, endo, and prosthetics into a unified vision. And here, this vision is, is very apparent, both literally and figuratively, because you can see everything, all the weak links, everything that needs to be addressed from start to finish. Axial cuts are initiated, and the attempt is made to keep the burr uh, away from damaging tooth structure, which is to remain. And you start cutting down. I know that the frication is here. I start cutting down, hoping to pick up the little bit of gutta percha that's in the distal buccal canal. And there's a welcoming landmark. And there's the tooth delivered. And this orientation is from the buckle, much as you would look at it if you were to take a radiograph. Turning at 90 degrees, this was a surprise to me, that the cone was actually out of the tooth. And I imagine when I did this uh, some 10, 10 years ago, the apex locator was beeping away, but I preferred to rely on the radiographic image. So yes, it's easy to be fooled. But note the concavity in this area, which is a result of the approximation of this root to the convexity of the mesial buccal root of the adjacent molar. It is here again that that vision of unifying or controlling the perio and restorative phase becomes apparent. At this point, we can start generating that very, very critical margin. Uh, we have to remove the roof of the frication. So without a core in place, with the flaps open, we have wonderful visibility to come in here with a margin and start trimming back, back and forth. And if we find we need more tooth structure, it's very easy to pick up a scalpel and just flake some bone away and, and cram lengthen via osseous reduction, judicious osseous reduction, flipping away some bone, trimming the margin a little bit more, and if you need a little bit more bone removal, you just go back and forth incrementally, developing a good margin, uh, native, untouched tooth structure for your new periodontal ligaments, uh, sorry, for the new uh, periodontal attachment. When a core is required, I pretty much always use amalgam uh, for the number one reason when doing 
core buildups in the presence of an open flap. Moisture control is critical. An amalgam is not bothered by moisture. It will set when there's moisture. I don't think I even used a matrix band. I probably just laterally condensed this against the recesses of what was the pulp chamber. It's very important to realize that, utmost important, not to walk away from a patient when you've condensed an amalgam core. Because if it sets, the only way to trim it is with rotary instrumentation. And that's one thing you do not want to do in the, in the presence of an open flap. You'll pulverize this material, it will get into the socket, under the flap, and you'll never get it away. It will leave the patient unhappy with an amalgam tattoo. If you just place a, a blade carver up against your margin and just start sweeping back and forth while it's in the soft phase, you'll generate the shape that you, that you need. And those large shavings will be easily evacuated with a high, with a high volume suction. The provisional crowns, the, in the 1.6, it was hollowed out, new methyl methacrylate resin, powder liquid was put in and just squashed onto the tooth. The excess was trimmed away. And you actually, with this material, you impress the margin. So you can accurately define where the new marginal outline should be. And here are those two crowns in place. The flap hasn't been closed yet. All the temporary cement's been removed. No amalgam particles are left. And you can see the quality of marginal adaptation that can be attained with this material. Now, this is a shape that I kind of know will work because of experience. But as Pythagoras said, all is geometry. And knowledge we've gained in, in the fields of chemical uh, the biological sciences at the chemical level, at the atomic level, at the molecular level, show this to be very, very true. So as case complexity increases, so do the changes we make to the geometry of hard and soft tissue and the occlusion. It's advantageous to make proper contour, properly shaped provisionals, so we can try out a new shape for that patient because it's only mother nature will judge if these changes in in the geometry are correct for this given case and i'm happy to say after three or four months the patient returns and mother nature i think is telling me that the fit and the finish is 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 good On removal of the provisionals, the socket has closed, the tissue is pink and healthy. This little bit of redness is a result of the tissue leaning against the acrylic, which on, which on the uh, microscopic level it probably has a biofilm on it of some kind and retention of amalgam, uh, sorry, of bacteria. But that should clear up once we get the final, final bridge work in. Next are on the list of things we need to control are accurate impressions. It's a vital link. It's our communication with the lab. Um, my personal preference is an acrylic custom tray with vinyl polysiloxane. You can use digital, you can use whatever you want, but whatever you use, you have to make sure that you pick up all the margins, 360, with a high degree of fidelity. You cannot leave any voids or any air bubbles because then the lab has to guess. Will they guess right? Or will they guess wrong? Uh, I don't want any guesswork. Uh, the little bit of white material that's here is a result of this. Uh, this was a photograph taken of this impression after the case was poured. But even after multiple pours, the margins are still there. Case is returned. Uh, the, here are the dyes, and here are the metal copings. The plan was to place two splinted crowns, and I, I use splinted crowns a lot. Uh, and even if it's two splinted crowns, I always have metal copings back 
without porcelain so I can assess the fit and finish. Um, with a fin if the case is returned finished, it's difficult to determine if it does hang up where it hangs up. So I like to have these cases um, back in separate units. Here are my provisionals on the master model. And that's the shape that I generated that Mother Nature has agreed with. This is what the lab sent back. Now they're masters at casting and waxing, but they don't appreciate all the hard work that's gone into defining this new geometry for this patient. So having the case come back in a metal framework in separate units, it's very easy to pick up a burr and try to work in the shape that has proven itself successful in the provisional phase. The metal copings are inserted and a solder index is done in the mouth and a solder jig is made in the office. And so I know that if it fits accurately here and it fits the jig that I make and on return after porcelain processing, if it fits the jig, it will fit the teeth with a high degree of accuracy. Again, it's a planned event. And here the case is returned. Again, I'm still fond of a fine metal margin. I don't, I don't find it um, a big concern for patients. If this were the, in the anterior, obviously we'd go to great lengths to hide that. And it's been contoured in such a way to provide access for hygiene instrumentation, uh, for interproximal brushes that the patient should use. The teeth on the day of insertion, healthy, no bleeding, no retraction cord, no local, and there are just no surprises. Again, this is a view that only the hygienist and I will see, and you can drive a truck through here. So maintaining this over the course of a lifetime is very, very easy, very manageable from the lingual. This radiograph shows that the metal margins fit with a very high degree of accuracy. So revisiting our goals, we must ensure periodontal health before insertion of a final case. And this photograph bears that out. Restorative margins must be finished on sound tooth structure and be located sufficiently coronal to an intact zone of gingival attachment. And again, the radiograph proves this, proves, proves this to be the case as well. Must ensure that the patient can effectively clean and thus maintain periodontal health over a lifetime. And we have to ensure that we can provide that maintenance as well. So the goals have been achieved with root resection, and it was to design and deliver therapy that is long lasting. And just this final case, again, elimination of a weak link. This just shows that root resection does not have to be a large surgical endeavor. In 2007, endodontic therapy was done for this tooth and an amalgam was placed, and an amalgam was placed in this tooth as well. Patient returned some seven or eight years later with a small chip complaining of some discomfort from this tooth. It required endodontic therapy, and again, I was going to place two crowns, two splinted crowns on these two teeth. But on close examination, the bone level comes up over the root of the distal buccal root, and there was frication involvement at the distal. There's the weak link right there. Extensive and expensive dentistry is being planned, and I want to eliminate any weak link. Here's the distal of that tooth, and you can see the palatal root, and then coming, this flares out quite extensively. And there's our frication involvement. After tooth preparation, without a flap, taking a small burr and just going down into the root surface here, again, picking up the little bit of gutta percha that's in the distal buccal canal is a very welcoming landmark. So I know I've gone halfway, I've got another, another halfway to go. Here the root's delivered. 
there's the gutta percha that's in the uh, in the um, in the chamber, and this is solid tooth structure from here to here. A new core is placed. This dark is not a shadow of any kind. It's just the color of the tooth structure in this area. Both teeth were prepared for crowns. Accurate impressions taken. Castings delivered, ensured that there's accuracy of fit of each casting, and then it's solder indexed in the mouth. Porcelain and the finished case. So from start to finish, I knew at this point how I wanted to end up. And because of experience, clinical experience, all these steps fell into place. Splinted crowns best resist tooth fracture. And it's important that if they are splinted, joined, that you provide adequate embrasure space for hygiene. The shape, everything has been worked out in the provisional phase and then mimicked by the lab. Root resected teeth studies show us really do not fail because of further periodontal breakdown. Usually they fail because of tooth fracture. And that is why splinted crowns were placed in this area. And the patient can go in between quite nicely with an interproximal brush, and this should last her hopefully another 30 years. I'd like to thank you for your attention. It's been my honor and privilege to provide continuing care for 35 years to a most loyal group of patients. This presentation was an attempt to demonstrate techniques that have proven successful over a long period of time. I thank you for your participation. Have a good day.